So, uh, welcome to the afternoon session. And uh, our first speaker is Sabino Matarese from uh, Padova University. And uh, he will talk about anisotropies and non-Gaussianity in the cosmic microwave background and gravitational wave backgrounds. So, uh, please, Sabino, the, the stage is for you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask you to tell me when I have, uh, let's say, five minutes left? Okay. So the uh, one. Yeah, sure. Um, I tell you. Okay. Okay. So the the idea of this talk is to put together two uh, aspects which appeared until a couple of years ago, quite um, uh, separated, and we are now understanding more and more uh, that there are many similarities and even cross correlations among among the signals from the early universe. And uh, that refers to, uh, in the last part of this talk, actually gave a lot of emphasis on this uh, gravitational wave anisotropies, which relies on uh, uh, at least three papers that we wrote together in a group of people, uh, many of which are, are in, this, uh, in this worship. I, I didn't attend the talks by Gian Massimo, by Matteo and uh, Emma this morning because um, I was teaching. So if I repeat something, please forgive me, but it was impossible for me to, to attend these talks. OK. Um, oh, let me see if I succeed to change the slide. OK, that should be the way. Fine. So let me start by showing you a very popular map of CMB and isotropies. This, this is the temperature map obtained by Planck. That is the last release, which is formally called 2018, even though we released it in 2019, and the papers will likely appear in a few more maps from now, so in 2020. Um, that is a full sky map. Uh, there are regions, the one with gray contours, which, have, which are essentially reconstructed with some sophisticated techniques because they, they, you have uh, oscuration by uh, the galaxy. Uh, the, 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 this one is a map of the E-mode polarization of the same uh, uh, from the same instrument from from Planck. Uh, that is um, the, the best we have at the moment. I mean, Planck uh, is probably the last mission which is going in the full sky and with high resolution. And the future is more more likely to be something focused on polarization one side or on small scales on the other on the other side, and uh, that is the TT uh, spectrum. It is a density power spectrum of the uh, anisotropies, in which you can see up to seven acoustic peaks of the of the CMB. Uh, and the, the fit is given in terms of very standard models. I'm going to, to, to tell you in, in a moment, of course, there are larger bars at low L, which are related to cosmic values. There is even some slight inconsistency, which has to be, which has to be understood. And there are some anomalies, which are uh, presently a um, matter of discussion, debate, and trying to and are trying to be understood by, by several by several groups. Um, the, uh, you, have, you have here the TE and EE, that is temperature, E mode polarization and uh, cross correlation and um, E mode only um, correlation, both, both in terms of, of angular power spectra, uh, still from Planck. And once again, you see that there is um, a good uh, best fit of the data, which is physically motivated that is the that is the idea I, I, I like I like the idea of quoting both in Gene Peebles because as the Nobel Prize uh, has been awarded is largely related to the very essence of the standard model I also want to, to tell you that I was recently asked to to write a popular article on Gene Peebles and I realized something which I had forgotten that his paper on the CMB um, uh, the, the, in the uh, 60s, actually, was a paper in which he was considering a, sc a scalar tensor theory. Okay, so it was really very, very early in the history of cosmology. He was considering, uh, it was considering a scalar tensor theory as a model to fit with the thermal history of the, of the universe. Uh, that is also taken from the Planck collaboration paper on parameters, uh, 
um, which appeared in 2019. And that shows you how good is the lambda cold dark matter model in fitting a, a, a large class of data ranging from the cosmic microbial background and isotopic polarization to last structural data and to uh, inform very high uh, wave numbers, also these so called Lyman Alpha Forest, Lyman Alpha Forest data. What is behind this, this model? Um, first important assumption, homogeneous and isotropic Friedman and Metropolis worker cosmological model. Second assumption, land according matter. Third assumption, initial conditions provided by inflation. Why am I mentioning these obvious things? I mention them because each of the, these three items would require discussion. Uh, homogeneity and isotropy should be actually probed against alternatives, which is not a trivial task. People started to look in this direction. For instance, people trying to get um, to get constraints on the anisotropies, on the geometrical anisotropies that you can have in the universe, finding very strong constraints. They also try to to constraint inhomogeneity, which is much, much more difficult, essentially, uh, to try to probe uh, homogeneity. What you have to do is to try to, uh, to constrain isotropy in different parts of the sky. That is the way to falsify the idea that the universe is homogeneous, besides being uh, isotropic. Um, lambda quarter matter contains many unknowns, of course. One is what is lambda. And the other one is becoming more and more severe, which is actually the origin of the core dark matter component that we have in the universe. Of course, there are many possible ideas of what is, uh, this matter can be. Fin finally, inflation in the universe, I mean, the cosmological part is very well developed. Uh, also, the theory for gener the generation of perturbations, both of scalar and tensor type, but um, we still lack of a truly fundamental theory to explain what the inflaton is, what is the energy scale of inflation, and many other aspects, which are uh, many other details concerning uh, this uh, very fundamental and very important model. So here is a summary of the open issues. Um, uh, I will really fully convinced that uh, the Friedman of Walker Lemaitre uh, model doesn't have any uh, reasonable alternative. Uh, what is the nature of dark matter? What is the, ener the nature of dark energy? Uh, and which kind of fundamental physics model is there behind inflation? In that respect, direct or indirect detection of the primordial stochastic rotation of the ground and or the detection of or upper bound on primordial negocity represent the clue to solve these problems. I'm trying to, to convince you later on. That is also a very popular uh, uh, plot, that is the region of acceptance of the models according to Plan 2018. And you see that the preferred models are those in this region. Uh, the, the more or less the center is the well-known Starobinsky model, uh, uh, which is also sometimes referred to as the X inflation model, the difference between the two has to do with the particle behavior of these two models, and there's still something which has to be understood and, and tested. I very much like always to refer to remember people that this dashed line is my power law inflation model, which was so predictive, predictive that it was falsified almost immediately, and we, which is what models should do, actually, should, uh, should be such as to be falsified if possible. Uh, by, by data. Indeed, this model was falsified by data. Okay, now um, I want to uh, exploit these results to start to talk about the rotation waves. These are plots obtained in a review paper with Marichal Guzzetti, Nicola Bartolo, and Michele Rigori, which we wrote down four years ago, in which, among many other things, we did the following. We said, okay, let's take a K to the N tensor power spectrum for, for, for gravitational waves. Okay, and uh, um, require that these gravitational waves uh, do not uh, um, overcome the Planck, uh, etc. It's not only Planck, uh, the, the combined uh, constraints from Planck and other data sets on the maximum amplitude of gravitational waves, if you like, all the value of R, the tensor to scalar ratio, um, as case related to the to the CMB. So we did that, and you can see that from these uh, the, these um, points on, on which all the curves uh, flow, 
And uh, given that, you change NT and you try to see whether there is any chance for the models to be, uh, for these gravitational waves to be detected directly in terms of in future uh, interferometers, okay? Of course, that requires um, the, the tensile aspect to be blue, that is with more power on most case, but the important point to be made is that given that you're moving from 10 to the minus 16 Earth to 10 to the minus 3 Earth, in the case of, of Lisa, there is a lot of, there is a very large range of scales which allow you, even with a small blue tilt, to, to, to uh, get a signal which can be detected. People uh, made the calculation that um, you would require something like NT equal to 0.2 to be, <coughs> to have this gravitational waves being detected by, <coughs> by, by Lisa in uh, when we will start to have data from from it of course point two is not an easy is not an easy quantity to 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 to, to get i'm going to comment on that in the future but it's important in the sorry in the, the next uh, slides but it's important to mention that uh, there is still some uh, room for the direct detection of primordial rotation waves from inflation if only we, we allow for the possibility that the tensile power spectrum is uh, blue. Otherwise, you have this kind of curve, which is the standard one, this slight red tilt has to do with the so-called consistency relation, and you see that in terms of LISA, LIGO Virgo, um, and uh, many other experiments, you don't have a chance to really, to really constrain these, um, these models. I want to take advantage of this discussion to mention a paper that with Giulia Capuri at CISA, Nicola Bartolo uh, in Padua, Davide Maino in Milan and myself, uh, which will appear very soon, and as you that we are just finishing in these days, which uh, does the following, we just follow a sort of standard technique which was uh, started many years ago by Will Kinney to study the flow equations in phase space for uh, inflation models, actually single single field inflation models, uh, and was also later extended to multiple fields, and uh, to to see what is the chance to have uh, models with some sensible blue tensor tilt, uh, started from a, a quite general class of theories. We took this uh, this action function from a paper with Matteo Fasiello, Nicola. Bartolo and Tony Riotto, actually, and uh, then out of this uh, quite general action, actually, which is um, uh, which is inspired by the effective theory of inflation, uh, we look for models in which NT is less than zero and models in which NT is um, is larger than zero. Uh, actually, in most cases, in order to get a blue uh, spectrum of rotation waves, you need to uh, violate the not urging condition, which which means epsilon less than zero, that is uh, positive H dot. Okay, uh, these are um, scatter plots obtained from this, this paper, which is uh, told is going to, to appear very soon in the archive. Uh, you can see from here, there, here we can see two cases basically epsilon uh, um, uh, larger than zero and epsilon less than zero. Uh, and we, have, we allow for the possibility for uh, um, tensor uh, um, uh, sound speed uh, less than one, okay? And also for a variation of tensor sound speed. And then in the second case, what we do is to enforce that CT is equal to one. I still refer it to what happens during inflation, okay? And then uh, we look at the various scatter plots. You see that in going from CT less than one to CT equal to one, the, the, the points are more um, clustered around uh, uh, NT equal to zero, essentially. That is due to many reasons. One reason is that we, we also look for the attractors of the system, and most of the attractors are really, are really uh, concentrated around NT equal to zero. In a sense, the situation for NT larger than zero, blue tilt, is specular to what you, what you see here. Also, you have allowed for the possibility that CT is less than one, and then in the second case, we enforce CT equal, being equal to one. You might remember there was a paper two or three years ago by Criminelli et al, in which they showed that uh, you can always 
transform your, your EFT model into one with CT equal to one by essentially exploiting a sort of redundancy on the underlying model. So it's not something which is, uh, which is mandatory, okay? It's just telling you that if you, uh, if you choose CT equal to one, you're going to pay a price of this choice in some other parameters. Parameters that if you really have only single thing facial, you apparently don't see, but you will see them as long as soon as you allow for reheating after inflation. So the other fields know that you change uh, other models of the theory. So that's why we allow for both possibilities in our, in our situation, but qualitatively the situation doesn't change very much. Requiring and to your point two is not that an easy task. Okay, so there are models which do fulfill this constraint. Of course, once you see this model, then you can make a second step, which is looking for what happens to these models. Which kind of models are they? Okay, to see uh, what is actually condition that you have to require in order to have such an interesting, interesting possibility. Let me also mention that in this paper, we don't show the results for the running of the tensor, tensor spectrum, uh, which um, tensor, sorry, spectral index, which might ease the detectability from, let's say, Lisa in the future. Okay. Now um, I want to uh, make a sort of introduction to primordial Gaussianity because I will exploit this result for my later later slides. So first of all, let me introduce the models that everybody is using. Uh, and since I started to work on that on that field many 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 years ago, uh, I, I always insist on the fact that this very simple formula was the result of a debate which went on for something like 10, 15 years, up, uh, up to the moment when some people said, okay, let's do the, the thing as simple as possible. Let's expand the gravitational potential in powers of a Gaussian field. And you can see that here you have a linear term, Gaussian, plus a quadratic term in the Gaussian, plus a cubic term in the Gaussian with these formally dimensionless parameters, FNL and, uh, and, and GNL, etc., etc. This very simple formula at the moment, at the beginning, was well, implied that F and L were constants, parameters. Later on, people extended this approach uh, to functions, which implies instead of having a product, you, you, you really have a, a convolution in this in this game. Um, uh, since the gravitation, the Bardeen's gravitational potential phi is not exactly constant outside the horizon, it depends upon the equation, the right equation of state, uh, then people some, somehow move to the, the common capture perturbation Z, which is better behaved. So uh, sometimes you find the same formula with some extra T over, over five uh, coefficients, because you, you, some people prefer to use Z instead of phi, but the definition of course is exactly the same. Now you should remember that <laughs> even both formally, sorry, I mistake, even both formally FNL and GNL are, are um, dimensionless because we take F phi to be dimensionless. Um, you should remember that phi is actually already by itself a small quantity, typically on the basis of CMBM isotropic measurements. You know that phi is worth 10 to the minus five or so which means that if you look at these relations here, um, if you take FNL to be a order of a few, which is what data tell you, that amounts to a percent of the in the data, which is of order 10 to the minus five. And uh, uh, GNL is constrained to some large number in terms of percent of the from GNL, you have 10 to the minus 10 times GNL, and the, what happens is that these two numbers are quite consistent. So we really have up to, in terms of this kind of models, a percent of the sanity, which is over 10 to the minus five or so. Uh, okay, now uh, in uh, the beginning of the 2000, basically people said, okay, that's not enough. Uh, we have more freedom than that. And uh, we should also look at possible shapes of the bispectrum. The spectrum is the simplest statistics, statistical estimate of the sanity. For instance, you can look at the uh, bispectrum of the gravitational potential, which because of homogeneity and isotropy can be written down this way. You have an amplitude FNL and a shape here, which is called F or K1, K2, K3. There are infinitely many shapes, but there are some of them which are better 
motivated by models. One is local normal sanity. Local normal sanity is the, is the case in which FNL is constant, uh, um, which is typical of multi-field models of inflation. You have equilateral normal sanity, in which you have triangles where uh, K1 is worth the K2 is worth the K3. Local instead uh, has been shown much later the idea of this FNL that uh, is, is peaked, that is, it has the highest signal to noise when, uh, when one of the three wave numbers is much less than the other two. But in coming back to this point later on for very important reasons. Finally, uh, the other important shape which was proposed was so called orthogonal Gaussianity, which has been called like that because it is orthogonal, essentially orthogonal to equilateral. That is also similar to, uh, sorry, there is another shape which is called flattened sanity, which is a Weber combination of equilateral orthogonal, I'm not going to mention it in the following. And of course, you have many more than that, and indeed the data tell you that the situation is much more complicated than this, uh, this simple, uh, simple idea. Um, uh, now, when people started to take this analysis very, uh, very seriously, essentially at the beginning of the, of the 2000, okay, uh, we started to try to understand the meaning of this sanity. So, Probably an sanity probed uh, fundamental physics during inflation, being sensitive to self interactions of fields present during inflation, different inflation models predict different amplitudes and shapes of the bias spectrum. However, standard models of lower inflation predict only a tiny deviation from Gaussianity. That was shown in a number of papers Salopek and Bond, 90, Gangi et al. 1995, Aqua Viva et al. 2003, Maldacena, 2003. And more, what we actually showed uh, in um, uh, in uh, the Gangetar paper, 1995, is that contrary to previous naive expectations, the low, the the the, the unavoidable level of sanity is not actually related to self-interactions to inflaton, but it is there even when the inflaton is um, is a uh, trivial. Uh, and it is there because of the unavoidable non-linearity of the underlying gravitational potential that is related to non-linearity of gravity, essentially. And um, that gives rise to, um, to uh, terms of order epsilon and eta, uh, which I'm going to discuss in a, uh, in a moment. Planck results are fully consistent with such a prediction, that is, if uh, at the moment, uh, Planck results are in perfect agreement with the idea that you may have the simplest possible model inflation with a single field, etc., etc. Okay. Then there, be, there has been a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion on the fact that pre-modern scientific probes interactions among particles and inflation. In this case, if I say that, of course, I refer to larger level of non uh, And there is a there are many, many papers, some of which have very nice titles like Cosmological Lighter Physics and the Dangerous Irrelevance of String Theory, which probably you know even better than me. Okay, uh, non sanity versus EMP. Okay, we just rapidly remind you that um, for something like maybe 10 years or so, uh, I've been coordinated together with Ben van der uh, a core project, the Planck collaboration, which was aimed at testing primordial normality, uh, and we got the best constraints uh, up to date in that respect. We have to compare what the situation that we knew before Planck, in which, for instance, for FNL, we had constraints were the 100. Okay, now we have much, much, uh, much, much better, much, much better constraints. Among them, we constrained local equilateral orthogonal shapes plus many more. Uh, and we, we included both temperature and E mode polarization. This analysis. We also got constraints on GNL and this is called tau NL, which is related to a particular type of four point function. Very briefly, let me tell you how to classify the situation. What you have to do is to look at the angular by spectrum of the CMB. Uh, which is described by this um, spherical harmonic decomposition whose coefficients are A and M that contains gamma integrals times this so called reduced by spectrum. And what you do is to plot the reduced by spectrum versus L1, L2, and 3 
and you should expect uh, something a region like that. There is a maximum value for this one and two and three, which has to do with the resolution of the experiment. And then depending on the shape, we will populate differently the region inside this uh, so-called tetrapid. There are conditions, the so-called triangle parity and resolution uh, okay, parity uh, uh, conditions, which have to do with the um, projection of, of homogeneity and, and isotropy into uh, um, an angular by spectrum. Expectations, local um, non-Gaussianity will rise to some, a plot like this in this uh, reduced angular by spectrum. Equilateral will be, will be centered uh, on the diagonal, orthogonal will give rise to something like that. These um, uh, reddest and, and bluest regions have to do with um, acoustic oscillation, so you should expect to see these sort of things. And then there is a signal which has to be there anyway, which is due to the unavoidable non-garcinity induced by the combination of uh, uh, integrated saxoof and lensing, and there is something uh, there is a similar effect also, which also works for uh, for polarization. Uh, let me go on. Uh, these were the expectations. These are the plots. Okay, so uh, temperature only, e polarization only, TPE, EET, -E uh, because of course you have two types of signals. You can combine them in different ways into into a by spectrum. So you see some um, uh, some patterns. Actually, these patterns have to do with cosmic variance modulated by the, um, the very presence of the acoustic uh, or the acoustic peaks. Constraints. Um, let's look at this part, which is after subtracting the Lansing SW contribution or Lansing some finesse contribution in the case of, of the E mode. The local is centered in minus 0.5 with an error, well, one sigma or bar of 5.6, equilateral 5 plus or minus 67, um, orthogonal minus 15 plus or minus 37. If you add also polarization, you get 0.9 plus or 1 minus 5.1, minus 26 plus or minus 47, minus 38 plus or minus 24. Don't be um, uh, impressed by the fact that formally equilateral and orthogonal seem to have much larger error bars. This has to do with definition of this shape, so it's not something which is intrinsic of the inability to constrain these, these shapes. Okay, to summarize, up to this point, Ramboldian science is currently the highest precision test of standard inflation models with Planck. PNG is constrained at better than 0.01%, while, for instance, flatness, spatial flatness of the unit is constrained up to 0.1%, and there is a coverture mode, uh, the presence of the mode is constrained to be up to 1%. So it's really the best determination we ever had up to this point. Forecast for the future. There was a paper written some years ago by a large group of people, um, uh, coordinated by, by Fabio Finelli, in, in which you have this, uh, these predictions for what future missions will do. Core, of course, has not been, been accepted, but Lightbird is. And you will see uh, what, is the, what are the prospects here for uh, improving somehow the, the the quality of the constraints by using a better account of uh, e mode polarization. Uh, then you have the, up, the, 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 the lower bound. So the lower bound is ideal up to 3000, which is the former resolution of Planck, but you cannot go much higher than that because of sick damping. And uh, uh, you see here that the error bar can become something like one half of what we have today. For instance, for the local and, and something similar for other, especially near, here we have um, uh, plots of the the expected bar in FNL as a function of Lmax. Okay, so situation to this point: standard inflation is still alive and kicking. Uh, standard inflation means single scalar field, more precisely, what is called the single clock. Canonical kinetic term in order to get, for instance, large. Equilateral negativity, you do need to have a non canonical kinetic term, for instance, zero dynamics, bunch day with initial vacuum state, and Einstein gravity. Uh, the standard inflation model predicts an FNL of order 10 to minus 2, but still non zero per more than a I'm coming back to this point later on. Um, there are other ways to try to concern negativity, go very uh, rapidly 
on this simply because it is a very interesting prospect to improve over what the CMB can do. One of these techniques is based upon the bias of dark matter arrows, which are tracing to the bias of galaxies. Uh, this idea was first proposed by Dalaretta in 2007, then Richard and myself actually improved uh, the, 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 the formulation of this, of this bias. We got a, a much more general formula, which is uh, plotted and, and referred to here, sorry. And what are the prospects? The most interesting prospects are uh, in terms of this spherex um, uh, mission, uh, which al will allow you to restrict the error bar on FN or something slightly below one, which is, of course, very interesting by many respects, even though it is not the level 10 to minus 2, which would be very interesting for many uh, for many purposes. Let me now mention something which is quite interesting and still matter controversy. One can write down this formula for the vice pattern in single thing inflation. Let me historically let me tell you that uh, uh, with uh, Alejandro Gandhi, Siva Moira, uh, Francesco Sin uh, Lukin, uh, uh, I wrote down a paper in 1995, which what we did was uh, to consider the most general canonical kinetic term scalar field with uh, general potential. And we got a formula for the bias spectrum using stochastic inflation techniques. Okay, that formula wasn't numerically perfect, but it, uh, uh, it identified where the problem is. That is, it identified the fact that you have no gasanity given by epsilon, not by epsilon squared, as was previously thought in the in previous papers by, for instance, Farkas, Rangaraz, and Zelenik, who had written a very nice paper on non gasanity in a cubic inflation model. Okay, then uh, Viviana, Paviva, Nicola, Bartolo, Tony Riotta and myself wrote a paper in 2001 in which we use second order perturbation theory to uh, redo the calculation. Okay, and then after a few months there was a paper by Maldacena in which he got results slightly different from ours because a, a, a sort of excessive approximation that we made in our calculation, but still the order minus one is exactly the same. The coefficient is only very uh, uh, poorly different. And the, the, the result is this formula here, in which you see there is a term proportional to the scalar tilt, one minus ns. Ns is the, scalar, the spectrum, is the spectrum index of scalar perturbation. And that there is another quantity, which if you like, is related to the tensor to scalar ratio, which amounts to epsilon in this very simple model. The first part multiplies a, a local shape, so it's squeezed by spectral triangles. The second part instead multiplies an equilateral contribution. Okay, and these of course are both related to the first order uh, zero roll parameters. Now, after uh, many years from the initial statement of this relation, people started to um, uh, to discuss about the actual observability of the Madassena's consideration, especially of this term here. Okay, and there were many papers written on this idea and which uh, uh, made a statement that by performing a pseudo dilatation of, of space or space coordinates, you could actually either, according to different groups, either completely cancel this term here or um, renormalize it to a smaller quantity of order 10 to minus one times this object here. Remember that this object, sorry, I have to go back here. This object uh, is already something like 10 to minus two. You have to think that NS, if I remember correctly from Planck, is something like 0.96 plus or minus something. I never remember that. But by the way, uh, you really have a deviation, a tilt, which is about 10 to minus two. Okay, so if you reduce it further, you get, you get at most 10 to minus 3. So it's very important to understand whether uh, that reduction is there or that cancellation is there. A similar discussion uh, also arose in connection with a GR contribution to FNL, which were, that had been obtained in, by a number of groups, uh, um, among which uh, Nicola, uh, Bartro, uh, Toriotto, myself, a few years before. Okay, now let me just advertise a paper that I'm finishing with, with Pilo and Rocco Rollo, in which we actually show that by taking uh, care of gate transformations involving long wavelength modes, uh, we show that it is impossible actually to modify this relation, both this relation here and this relation here. There is no way actually to remove these signals or even change them. And because of that, our conclusion is that th those effects are physical and observable by future sensitivity experiments with no change 
compared to the original formula. Uh, we are going to publish this paper very soon, actually, and we show in detail how our results compare with previous analysis made by people. Okay, now we move to uh, anisotropies of the stochastic rotation of the ground for inflation and primordial sanity. This is based upon at least two of these papers, this one here and uh, and this one here, and I won't actually enter into discussion of uh, gravitational wave anisotropy from primordial break course. Uh, there were only two papers prior to us, ours discussing that, one by Albert Madassena in 2006 and one by Carlo Contaldi in 2000, sorry, 2016, one by Carlo Contaldi in 2017. Let me just mention that the paper by Albert Madassena uh, is uh, uh, well, probably the only paper by Madassena which has a very small number of quotations. He, 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 uh, until one month ago, he said something like four quotations, okay, two of which from us. Okay, so he, people really didn't realize the importance, the extreme importance of that, of that paper. Okay, a derivation of the angle of spectrum of cosmological anisotropies um, was done by us using a Boltzmann equation approach that was attained previously by Albert Madassena in a very uh, synthetic equation, we say, and also by Contaldi. And we, we made um, a much more detailed and complete calculation in these papers, which I, I mentioned before. Uh, let me summarize the contents and I will show you some questions. Anisotropies in the cosmological background are imprinted both at its production and by GW propagation through the last case color and tensor perturbations of the universe. Uh, let me uh, notice that the first contribution, that is the imprinting uh, at production, is not present in the CMB addition as the universe is not transparent to photos before the combination. Um, and that causes an order one dependence on the anisotropy and frequency, which is not there in the case of the CMB. Um, also, we provide a new method to characterize the cosmological stochastic rotation wave background through its possible deviation from Gaussian statistics. In particular, this background will become a new probe of the primordial anxiety of cosmological perturbations. Let me show you a plot. Uh, for which I have to thank Nicola Bartolo, uh, which you see the production, okay, sorry, the, the, the production for instance at inflation. I put from inflation in parentheses because this is a very general approach which you can apply to any sort of primordial source of rotational waves. So um, uh, you you uh, have this uh, this emission surface, which by many respects is similar to the last scattering surface in the case of the CMB. Uh, after that, the universe is transparent to these gravitational waves unless you have some uh, later sources, like for instance the astrophysical gravitational wave background. Okay, and then uh, the, 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 this background of gravitational waves uh, is uh, um, travels through the perturbed universe and is becomes sensitive to both scalar potentially even back to the field, uh, perturbations during its travel, okay? What you have to do is to adopt the Boltzmann equation approach in which high frequency gravitational waves become the, uh, are dealt with in terms of a big ground, exactly as you do in the case of the CMB, or if you like in the case of the neutrino uh, cosmic background, while low frequency gravitational waves are as perturbations of the metric and similarly for scalar perturbations, and they affect the evolution background uh, during propagation. Okay, so there are two contributions to this background one at production to this background anisotropy of the system, one at production which is fully erased in the case of CMB because of contact scattering, and the second one by propagation to the observer. It should be a tool. Um, it's important to stress that this background uh, also brings frequency information in constant with CMB ones, which uh, we have good reason to believe that is thermalized, essentially because it had all the time to thermalize, uh, only thanks to Compton scattering, besides the, 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 the origin of this background. Uh, of course, in the case of CMB, you do have some frequency information, but you have to go to spectral distortions in order to start to see such an information. Um, you can write the usual uh, Boltzmann equation, very similar to the one for, for CMB photo, essentially, which we have a free streaming term, with a free streaming contribution, with these very standard terms, and gravitational effects in terms of both scanners, 5 psi, 
and, and tensors, and which multiply this usual very standard combination. Then you can parameterize situation in this very simple way. You have the background term and then this uh, object gamma, uh, which is related to the um, fluctuation in the intensity in the relation ways in different directions. Notice that gamma here depends upon time, is that is that in CMB, case of CMB. Position, okay, this position will actually give rise to the free, the, the, sorry, the wave number, wave vector dependence, the frequency, which at, fir at first order is not present in the case of CMB, and of course the direction uh, of propagation of the signal. Um, you, know, you, yes. you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you very much. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. So um, let me go on a little bit to define what happens here. So let me insist on the, 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 the way you do the calculation. For people who are, are, are familiar with CMB and NSO, you will see that many terms will be very similar. That's a very important difference. In the case of CMB, this term is completely erased by uh, Compton scattering. Uh, so you don't see that at all, okay? And then uh, um, there are these three terms. Initial term, initial condition term, the scalar part and the tensor part. So this gravitational wave background also feels, of course, is a very nonlinear effect, the very presence of low frequency gravitational waves on the way to the observer. Um, uh, what about the initial conditions? Okay, and what about the frequency dependence? This contribution is completely erased by conditions in the case of CMB and isotropies. You start to see it only at second order in perturbation theory. Instead, in the case of the gravitational wave background, it, is, uh, it will be visible in the fermenter's case. Um, sorry, if the stochastic gravitational wave background is visible in the fermenter's case, this term will be present, can lead to an isotopic with large order one frequency dependence. Okay, non Gaussianity. Uh, non Gaussianity for this background uh, can be there for different reasons. Initial conditions, okay. Uh, of course, that was that is, for instance, the case of pre-model by core models. Uh, so initial conditions, uh, in many cases, can be rise to some intrinsic non uh, in this signal. In the case of CMB, that uh, initial condition information is lost anyway. Second contribution, propagation through non gaussian scalar modes. Okay, very similar to what happened in the case of CMB. All the constraints which I gave you on FNN were based precisely upon this second effect here. Then there is a third effect, which is propagation through non Gaussian tensor modes. In the case of CMB, we do have a similar effect. We also have constraints uh, on uh, non Gaussianity in tensor modes, uh, which of course are quite weak because, uh, because we don't see directly in so we can only see that them indirectly. And um, in this case, you can have this non Gaussian tensor modes in many classes of models, among which the second door, the, the gravitational waves produced by, sc by scalar modes. Uh, I remember there were two talks yesterday about, about this issue, uh, which were originally proposed by Tomita in 1967. There were, there were a bunch of papers by uh, myself and my collaborators in, in the late 90s about that. Uh, there is a, a recent interesting idea by Ashet et al. for uh, using this tensor regression to cross correlate with CMB. I just want to mention that at second order, not only you produce uh, gravitational waves from scalar perturbation, but you also succeed to do the inverse process. Um, I'd like to spend some more words very rapidly on uh, what happens in the case of another background, which in a sense would be a sort of uh, foreground to look for this primordial signal, and that is the astrophysical stochastic gravitational background, that is the background produced by unresolved astrophysical sources. I just want to mention that, uh, of course, there are many possible sources. We recently proposed uh, a, a model, a calculation in which we accounted for all projection effects, adopting the so-called cosmic rulers formalist, that is in Bertanka et al. paper, uh, which includes also um, Angelo Ricciardone, Alvise Canelli, myself, Mary Sacchidariado, Alex Jenkins, Nicola Bellomo, and Tania Regimbao. And um, uh, we use this technique, which is very standard in dealing with other similar backgrounds like the infrared uh, cosmic infrared background, and we just use the same, exactly the same technique, which has been used and tested by many groups uh, 
for the backgrounds, and that gives rise to a number of corrections of inconsistencies present in previous uh, uh, approaches. This is a plot uh, for a particular type of sources, and uh, that uh, emphasizes the difference compared to previous approaches. But I don't think I have enough time to look at that. What is the prospects to measure? Okay. Of course, to measure anisotropy, first of all, you have to measure the gravitational waves. That's why I spent some time discussing these blue tilted gravitational waves. Okay. So, if you want to measure anisotropies, first of all, you have to look to, to, to measure the monopole. And then, uh, very likely, we'll only be able to, to measure the lowest or the multiples, but there is a lot of information in this lowest or the multiples, which we succeed to measure this anisotropy, this, this background will be extremely important, will give it, uh, rise to a huge amount of information on the early universe. Uh, that's another paper which I don't have time to discuss. Maybe, maybe Jean Massio mentioned that in his talk, I don't know. Um, conclusions, the next challenge. Inflation provides a causal mechanism for the generation of cosmological perturbation. CMB last structure data fully support the detailed predictions of inflation. The direct detection of primordial rotation wave background, primordial no gaussianity with the specific features predicted by inflation will provide strong independent support to the model. Needless to say, the next challenge is on one side measuring FNL of order 10 to minus 2. It is not an easy task. The most important prospects in that direction are in terms of the so-called um, 21 centimeter background uh, in absorption. Uh, so it's something which is not going to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be obtained tomorrow, but there are prospects for the future to be able to reach these values of uh, accuracy. Uh, the next challenge on the other side is to detect an isotropies of the stochastic rotation of the ground and astrophysical rotation of the ground, which are both sensitive to uh, the propagation through inhomogeneities. This will open a new window on both the fundamental physics model behind inflation and the properties of dark matter that can in terms of fluctuations on the way. Let's stop here. Thank you, Sabino. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have time uh, for a few questions. Uh, uh, Shunshan, please. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I remember you mentioned that uh, the uh, GR nonlinearity will leave the uh, non Gaussianity FN arrow, yeah. which is uh, minus uh, five over three. Yeah. Um, yeah. on these uh, dark matter distributions. But yes. I remember yeah. a few years ago, um, there was also a paper uh, a re re reported, I think it's the same result, uh, minus five over three on mm -hmm. the velocity on those large scale structure. I think uh, probably David Wang is, is the author. Uh, is there any connection to his work? Oh, of course. Okay, let me tell you. Uh, that's right. There were essentially two groups of people. I mean, we, we did the calculation uh, many years ago. Actually, we were the first to do the calculation. Uh, there was a paper, Bartolo, Matarese, Riotto, signatures of uh, uh, non gaussian like the universe. And they, in that paper, we actually got this term in the in the synchronous gauge. It's not exactly minus five thirds. It is minus five thirds times a modulation. <laughs> Uh, it is minus five thirds in the in the squeeze limit, let me say. Okay. And then there was a paper by Wands, Bruni, et al., which they got the same result actually using a short, long split technique. And there were many papers five years ago, five six years ago, uh, in which they said you can actually cancel this term in exactly the same way in which they claim you can cancel Mandelstam's consistent simulation by uh, performing a suitable dilatation of, uh, of space, okay? Um, uh, the discussion is still there, actually. Uh, let me tell you, the discussion evolved in time because some people originally said that uh, you don't see that term anyway, not even in the dark matter distribution, okay? You don't see that in the dark matter distribution, you don't see that in the, in the bias, you don't see that in the evolution of the bias. Then other people said, no, actually, the, the term is there in dark matter. Uh, the people said, okay, that term is there in dark matter and also in the evolution of the bias, but it's not there in the bias. In the paper that we're going to produce soon, we say that it's there in all the three observables. So it's a true term. Uh, okay, so let, wait and see and see our paper. Yeah, okay. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, okay. 
Hello, I have a question. Hello, yeah, can you I, hear me? Yes, yes please. Uh, yeah, okay. So in the last slide, it is mentioned that our next challenge is to measure the FNR up to 10 power minus 2. So right. my question is uh, how much severe is the foreground challenge? Like we have galactic foregrounds uh, in the CMB measurements. So how much this is causing a problem? Okay, in the case of the CMB, I should say that the, the foreground was considered to be a problem uh, well before we started to do the calculation because there were ni very nice papers showing that you can very, uh, very uh, rigorously, okay, um, get rid of this program contamination and reach the values that we got for FNL, which are very close to the ideal experiment. Okay. okay, so the reason why we are not ideal is simply because the polarization data from Planck are not do not cover a large enough range of uh, multiples to, to reach uh, ideality. Okay, okay. so grants okay. were not really in the case of galaxies, of course, it's more complicated because in the case of uh, if you want to use galaxy clustering to measure FNL, mm -hmm. then I tend to believe that most estimates are uh, too optimistic because. Uh, there are many steps in this calculation, going from dark matter to halos, from halos to galaxies, and these many steps involve more and more astrophysics. So, um, so that's really okay. Okay. The, the, the best chance in this case is, is 21 centimeter, but in order to do that, you, the best would be to go to assortion. Assortion means uh, uh, frequencies at which the best would be, would be to go to the moon. Actually, there were, there were um, uh, proposals in this direction uh, in the past. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome.